The Old Testament reading today comes from the book of Job, chapter 11, verses 7 and 8, and it can be found on page 399 in your pew Bible. Can you find out the deep things of God? Can you find out the limit of the Almighty? It is higher than heaven. What can you do? Deeper than Sheol, what can you know? Well, our second reading today is a gospel reading. It's from the Gospel according to St. Luke, from the 20th chapter, beginning in the 27th verse. And this is an exchange that Jesus had with a group of religious folks in the temple in Jerusalem, beginning in verse 27. Some Sadducees, those who say there is no resurrection, came to him and asked him a question. Teacher, Moses wrote for us that if a man's brother dies, leaving a wife but no children, the man shall marry the widow and raise up children for his brother. Now, there were seven brothers. The first married and died childless. Then the second and the third married her. And so, in the same way, all seven died, died childless. Finally, the woman also died. In the resurrection, therefore, whose wife will the woman be? For the seven had married her. Jesus said to them, Those who belong to this age marry and are given in marriage. But those who are considered worthy of a place in that age and in the resurrection from the dead neither marry nor are given in marriage. Indeed, they cannot die anymore because they are like angels and are children of God, being children of the resurrection. And the fact that the dead are raised, Moses himself showed in the story about the bush where he speaks of the Lord as the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Now he is God not of the dead, but of the living, for to him all of them are alive. May God add his blessing to the reading of his holy word. Let's pause for a moment before we reflect. Oh God, we thank you for this new year. We thank you for what it represents, all the opportunities, the exciting chances ahead to experience your grace. We pray that as we seek you here in this place, that you would meet us and be with us. Fill us with your grace. Appear to us in, in ways that, that we can understand so that we can follow you faithfully. Draw us into your holy word and reveal your wisdom to us, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, a teacher was having trouble teaching arithmetic to a little boy in her class. His name was Matthew. So, to help Matthew understand, she said, Matthew, if you reached into your right pocket and found a $5 bill, and then you reached into your left pocket and you found another $5 bill, what would you have? And Matthew replied, somebody else's pants. <laughs> See, every day we learn new things about people in the world and about the world itself, things we didn't know before. Um, in fact, learning is a part of being human, a, a special part of being human. And today, humanity on the whole is learning more than we ever have. In a conference last year, Google CEO Eric Schmidt, he started the conference with this remark. He said, every two days now, humanity creates as much information as we did from the dawn of civilization up until the year 2003. Pretty remarkable. With the help of technology, 
Human knowledge is becoming more sophisticated by the moment. You know, this has fueled a perspective that some have, that statistics say a growing number of people have in our society and other places throughout the world, that if there's something the human race either can't currently understand or make progress toward understanding someday, if there isn't a concept that, that we can understand, then we should doubt its existence. You know, the, the idea is that uh, if we believe humanity's information gathering prowess has, has, has proven, you know, that we can, we can gather so much information that there's nothing we eventually can't figure out. You know, we, we're just that smart is a growing viewpoint. Well, you know, that certainly sounds interesting. But the question that I have is where does faith fit into that kind of perspective? Because faith by definition involves believing there are some things about reality, some things about God, God's ways, life beyond this world, that we human beings will never completely understand in this life. As we read in the letter to the Hebrews, uh, faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. Or as God declared in our reading today from the book of Job that Carolyn wrote, uh, uh, read to us, it says, can you discover the depths of God? Can you discover the limits of the Almighty? Job is attempting to understand God, and, and God responds with a series of questions, you know, leaving Job hanging. There's things that Job just cannot understand. You know, but this idea that we can understand is something that is growing, and it's affecting the way that people view faith overall. That faith is a, is a quaint concept, that perhaps it's helpful for some, maybe less advanced people, but it's not really necessary. It's helpful if it can get us through difficult times, um, but it's not really necessary. In fact, According to this perspective, when people take their faith too seriously, that is a problem. I think the famous philosopher and atheist Richard Dawkins, uh, he sums it up very succinctly when he once said, I am against religion because it teaches us to be satisfied with not understanding the world. So how do we respond? Well, with all due respect to that viewpoint, uh, my response is, thank God that religion teaches us to embrace mystery. Because I don't believe that mystery represents just more for us to, to learn in the future. I believe there are some things that we cannot know on this earth. And embracing that, embracing that faith, it illumines a darkness. It eliminates an absence. It fills an emptiness in our lives that limits us. It's faith itself that helps us reach our full potential. Now, I love humanity's pursuit of knowledge. I celebrate every new scientific discovery and technological advancement that's announced. But it seems to me that the more we learn, the more mysterious reality, in many respects, appears to become. 
You know, there's our inability to reconcile quantum physics with Einstein's theories. You know, to develop a, a single workable theory of, of everything. That's a huge gap in our knowledge that it just seems so difficult for us to fill. Uh, and then there's this idea of whether there's more than one universe or not. And if not, what our universe is expanding into. More questions. New discoveries oftentimes feel like a game of, of whack-a-mole. We discover this new thing and, oops, twice as much mystery pops up. But I don't think that this is something that we need to be discouraged about. Nor should it keep us from continuing to seek for new answers. Whether I believe we can celebrate and we should celebrate both. That gaining new knowledge is a beautiful thing. But faith also isn't silly. In fact, accepting it, embracing it, that's what gives us the humility we need to receive God's blessings. And I bring this up because I believe that that was something Jesus was dealing with in his day and age in our gospel reading today. A struggling with not knowing and what that means is something that's not unique to our day and age. It's been a problem throughout time. And in our gospel passage today, Jesus speaks right to a group of folks who were talking about it. The, our passage, as I mentioned, it's part of a larger passage in the book of uh, St. Luke's Gospel where Jesus is, is giving teachings in an area of the temple toward the latter part of his life. And here he, he comes into conflict uh, with a group of people, members of the, the Saju Kion, which I know sounds like an alien race, but uh, it actually refers to the Sadducees, uh, who were a Jewish sect. Now, most of Jesus' arguments recorded in the Gospels, they're with members of the Pharisees, another group. But here, he argues with the Sadducees. So, you know, Jesus was an equal opportunity corrector. You know, it wasn't matter, <laughs> didn't matter who the person was or how lofty their title was that they held in society. Uh, he was willing to, to, uh, to have dialogue with him. But as I mentioned, the Sadducees, they were closely associated with the temple in Jerusalem, which is probably why Jesus is arguing with them here. And though we don't know everything about what they believed, our passage itself tells us that they had a problem with the resurrection after death, the, the problem with, a, with an afterlife that uh, involved the resurrection. Um, many Jews, when they spoke of the afterlife in the ancient world, spoke of Sheol, which simply meant the grave. So there was a, a lot of ambiguity about what would happen. Uh, but other Jews around the time of, of Christ began talking about rising from the dead. And, and uh, you know, the Sadducees had a problem with this. So they begin to argue with Jesus about it, saying in verse 28, Teacher, Moses wrote for us that if a man's brother dies and leaves a wife but no children, the man must marry the widow and raise up offspring for his brother. Now there were seven brothers. The first one married a woman and died childless. The second and then the third married her. And in the same way, the seven died, leaving no children. Finally, the woman died too. Now then, at the resurrection, whose wife will she be since the seven were married to her? Now, my initial response to this question, after my head stopped spinning, you know, would have been, uh, could you repeat that? But you see, that was the Sadducees' point here. Uh, they didn't really understand what they were talking about either. In fact, their point was to, to bring up a convoluted hypothetical situation to cast doubt on the idea of, of the resurrection. Uh, after, uh, you know, we, we pass away, upon there being life after death. They were, they were mocking it uh, because there were things about the afterlife 
that they couldn't understand. And their sentiment was that, well, if I can't understand it, then it must not exist. That sounds awfully familiar. But I love the way that Jesus responds in verse 34 when he challenges them to imagine an afterlife where marriage didn't exist. He takes their very example and kind of blows the concept of marriage out of the water altogether. And, and, and why would he, he bring this up? Well, to first century Palestinian Jews, marriage and family were central to reality. There was no reality without them. So to imagine a world without them would have been impossible for the Sadducees. Uh, but that is the very world Jesus challenges them to accept as real. And when he says in verse 37, even Moses showed that the dead rise, for he calls the Lord the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, but of the living, for to him all are alive. In other words, there is mystery associated with heaven. There are things about the afterlife that we don't understand. Maybe things as crazy as the absence of family. But you know something? That's okay. That ambiguity is okay. That mystery is okay. You don't have to reject the whole concept just because it's something that you don't feel you can ever learn in this world. You can embrace it. Because embracing that mystery will give you the humility that you need to receive that and many other of, of God's blessings. That's what embracing mystery does in our lives. You know, we are in a time of, of rapid change. We're um, amazing you know, technological devices and, and amazing scientific knowledge is, is being discovered and, and developed every day. Human progress is undeniable and it's good. We should acquire as much knowledge as we can every day and continue that quest with vigor. But I think our passage today and others like it, they challenge us that in the midst of that quest, to never forget the wisdom of understanding that there are things that humanity will never completely understand in this world. Some things will always be a mystery and that we don't have to doubt their existence because of it. In fact, embracing that mystery is what frees us, what shapes us, what opens us to receive the fullness of God's blessings, to give us hope in the midst of pain, to give us peace in the midst of misunderstanding, to give us the presence of God's Spirit in all things. You know, passages like this, I believe, invite us to ask ourselves many questions, including, do I sometimes doubt God's existence? Because there are things I can't understand about God. Things I can't understand about God's ways. And if so, how might my faith, my life change if I began to celebrate what I don't know about God and what remains mysterious to me about this world. Amen.